For many years, I was a molecular biologist doing laboratory experiments with cells in petri dishes, and we would infect them with viruses and study how viruses get inside of the cells and how they spread to other cells. And that was great, fascinating work. But while I was doing that work, I started to wonder why is it that two people can be infected with the same virus and have very different outcomes, depending on things like where they live. So after I finished my PhD, I started to study global health and social systems. That involved a lot of reading and learning more about all the things that I didn't know. And then one day, I get a text message from a senior colleague who is internationally known in global health research. And it says, do you know anything about cell biology? And I thought, well, <laughs> yes. So I said, yes. She invites me to a meeting. I come in the room, two social scientists sitting at a table, and then here I am. And she says, I wrote to you because I was studying with my daughter. She's in middle school, helping her study for a biology exam. And the term diffusion came up. Now, in social sciences, when we talk about diffusion, we talk about innovation diffusion, which is the spread of ideas in human social systems. I had never seen this as a biology term before. And in global health, when we're interested in innovation diffusion, what we want is to, we have a great idea, simple. Some, maybe let's say it's a better way to purify water or a new form of birth control, and we want to spread that. We have a lot of challenges. We take it to a place, we try to implement it where we know there's a need, where people are interested, and we come back later, nothing's happened. So my question for you, she says to me, is can we learn anything from biology about how to spread ideas? So we talk about this a little bit. And I said, well, you know, if we want to learn about spread from a biological model, something that's evolved to be good at spreading is a virus. We talk a little more, and we talk about we want to make permanent change. And well, if you want to make permanent change, and you want to look at a virus, HIV is a great model for this, because when it infects a cell, it is in that cell forever. And so that's what we did. My two colleagues and I sat around talking about how can we learn from the molecular steps that HIV follows to infect a cell and spread to other cells and apply that to innovation and spread in human systems? So I'm going to tell you about six steps that apply to both. But first, let me tell you about HIV. It has nine genes. That's important because the cells that it infects have 20 to 25,000 genes. Cells have a boundary around them that is quite complete. Inside of that boundary are all kinds of complicated interacting systems, maintaining our DNA, reading our genes, maintaining nutrients, checking on water, all kinds of stuff happening inside that cell, which to HIV is massive. How does it get in? Now let's apply this to a human system. Let's take a hospital. A hospital also has a boundary. I learned this from my other social science colleague who studies, um, he's a psychologist, studies people in groups. There are boundaries around groups of people. The inside a hospital are all kinds of complicated systems, nurses, doctors, custodial staff, cafeteria workers, hospital administrators, all working inside of this hospital. How do you get in if you have an innovation? Let's look at what HIV does. In order for a cell to cross its boundary and communicate with the world outside, it has something called receptors. Now, these are boundary spanning. They have part inside and part outside. HIV has evolved to fit those boundary spanners, and that's how it gets in. That's step one. Use a boundary spanner to get in. This turns out to be also true in a hospital setting. So we studied one innovation, which was a set of steps to improve survival for a patient who arrives at the door with a heart attack. You take a few steps, get that patient to treatment within 90 minutes, they have a much better chance of surviving. That's a very simple innovation. How do you get that into a hospital? You bring it in with someone who already brings in new ideas, a person who's part of the hospital, part of outside. And those people are also called boundary spanners. Step two, HIV, it's in now. It brings in something called RNA. Now, you may not have heard of RNA, but you've heard of DNA. That's where those 20,000 genes are inside of the cell. That's the language that the cell speaks. HIV has evolved to understand this. It has to make its message into an accessible language for the cell. So it changes its RNA into DNA. This is step two, make the message accessible. Now, this innovation that I described to you to improve survival for patients with a heart attack, that was first published in academic journals in all kinds of 
academic, I want to say highfalutin language. That doesn't work for a lot of people. You have to make that message accessible if you're bringing this innovation into a human system so that the people who are going to be using it understand what you're talking about. Step two. Step three, HIV makes DNA. And one of the things that is a hallmark characteristic of HIV is how much it mutates. Why does it do this? So that it can adapt to its environment. It evolves to fit the changes that are going on all around it. This is a feature of HIV that makes it very difficult for us to counteract because it helps it be so good at spreading. That's step three, be adaptive. In the hospital setting, you have these steps. You bring them in, and they say, uh, step three is not going to work for us. If you can't be adaptive and make some changes there, you're not going to implement anything permanent and sustainable. Be adaptive. Now, as I described to you, this cell is complicated. It has evolved to maintain the status quo. And it's no fool. Cells already have all kinds of resistance mechanisms inside them to counteract virus infection. HIV has evolved to anticipate this resistance and overcome it. Remember I said it has nine genes? It uses quite a few of those, a significant portion of its resources to anticipate and overcome resistance. And as we all know, in a human social system, you're part of any kind of group. This is the way we do things here. Don't come in here and tell me that we're going to change. We, we maintain the status quo. In innovation, diffusion, and social systems, in spreading new ideas, you have to be ready for the person who says, I'm not doing it. Anticipate and overcome resistance. So you've got HIV, DNA inside the cell. But how does it make itself permanent? It takes its DNA, goes to the place in the cell where we have our own cellular DNA. That's where those 20,000 genes are. It cuts the cellular DNA, pastes in the HIV DNA, DNA, and now it's permanently part of the cell forever. This is called integration, and that's step five. Become part of the way that things are done. Get into the DNA. And it turns out this is also true. So in the innovation to improve survival for heart attack patients, those simple steps had to become part of the way that we do business. The way that the hospital does things, when a person with a heart attack shows up at the door, those steps are the steps we follow every single time to get treatment within 90 minutes. They are integrated into the practices of the system. Now, I've spent a lot of time already telling you how HIV gets into one cell and becomes a permanent part of one cell. But how does it spread? As you know, human immunodeficiency virus targets the immune system. So these cells that it infects are immune cells. Inside the body, these cells are already circulating all throughout the body with the goal of fighting off all kinds of infectious agents. We eat them, we breathe them, we touch our nose, and they get in. HIV infects a few of those cells, and then it spreads through that existing mechanism to others, eventually getting all over the body. And this is step six, spread using existing systems. You have a hospital successfully implemented changes to improve survival for heart attack patients. This has happened in one hospital. In order for it to spread, it goes across existing communication networks, hospital association meetings, meetings of cardiologists. It spread these new ideas through existing ways of communication and existing systems. So that's step six. So in answer to my colleague's question, can we learn anything from biology about how to spread ideas, life-saving ideas, in human systems? The answer is yes. And we can not only learn from biology, but we can learn from a virus that has been so good at evolving to spread that it has been notorious, horrible, at horrible cost to human health. But if we can take these six steps and use them when we have a great new innovative idea that we know can save lives, then maybe it will be worth it. Thank you. <laughs>